what an honor to be here. So we're going to go on a ride. It's going to get a little fast and furious here. But I'm going to begin with a story about how this revolution that we're engaged in began. Who began it, why they began it, and why it might be one of the most important things happening in the history of humanity. It's all about the space revolution. Look, we've had a rough year, year and a half. Something came at us that wasn't expected. It caused immense challenges, many, many deaths around the world. And yet our science rose up and fought against it. It's fighting against it even as I speak. We've had amazing cooperation and amazing differences rise up during the same period between all of us on the planet. And yet, right in the middle of it all, one of those rockets, one of those ones you maybe don't remember, as was just mentioned, three, did something two, incredible. One, In fact, mission. several of them. And I want you to think about that, especially if you're one of those nerds we just talked about, because in the middle of all this craziness, in the middle of all this insanity, there were a couple of things that got everybody's attention. This is the SpaceX Starship. What I love about this rocket, this amazing piece of technology, is that it's just a rocket. It's just steel and fuel and imagination. And it's doing incredible things. Because if this vehicle flies and the ones like it that are on the drawing boards make it into space, the railroad will be open. And off we will go into a new an incredible tomorrow. By the way, when it comes to nerds, I think I'd have to say this is sort of uh, what you might call nerd pornography. This is the kind of thing we get excited about. How high can it go? How many times can it fly? What's the delta V? That's nerd speak, by the way. Here it is coming in. It's amazing. It's coming in for a beautiful landing. This is happening a few miles south of me in, on the coast of Texas. But it could be happening anywhere, and I'll come back to that in a moment. It nails the landing. Now, one of the things that's kind of funny about this is, of course, a few minutes later, it blew up. But that's the point in the age of innovation. You do things, you try them, you break them, you do them better, and you do them again. As one friend of mine said, it doesn't matter how many times you fall down, as long as you get up one more time than that. And look, this is all very, very cool. You know, the, the Tesla in space, it's amazing, it's wonderful, but it's really not about that. It's not about billionaires and, and technology, it's about her. It's about the Earth. I love this planet. I was the annoying Greenpeace volunteer that would put my foot in the door as the lady tried to close it and say, you don't care about the whales? I love this planet. I love everything about it. I also like the people. I like us. I like human beings. As bad as we can be, as much as we struggle with this thing that is inside of our head called consciousness, we try. We try to do the right thing. And as we do, we try to explore. We try to open new places, new frontiers. This is my daughter touching a flower for the first time in her life. That is what it means to be a human being. And yet we haven't really begun to fully realize that in our activities. In fact, we have locked ourselves to the ground. It isn't gravity that keeps us on the ground. It isn't radiation. It isn't vacuum. It's lack of imagination. It's lack of the willingness to try but some of us are. In fact, very long ago, in the middle of the last century, it started. We had our first space race. From that came, by the way, the beginning of the environmental movement as we began to see the bubble, this little blue bubble in space called the Earth. And we got to the moon as, as the result of this international, I am bigger and badder than you race. And after taking probably what you might call today the most expensive selfie in human history, at the end of it all, all we had was flags and footprints. There were some spin-offs, amazing technology. We're speaking to each other using elements of that technology right now. But one of the most important spin-offs was a group of children watching this happen on their TV screens. Now, that time wasn't so different from the time we are in today. 
There were terrible things going on. There were terrible leaders out in the world. There were riots over race. And looming over it all was a fear of death. Unlike school kids in my country today who have to dive under their desks from fears of shooters, we dove under our desks from fears of nuclear Armageddon. In fact, the clock put out by the Union of Concerned Scientists showed we were one minute to midnight, to the end of it all. And yet on that same TV set, you could turn it on and see people driving around on the moon. You could see the Enterprise going to places unexplored. And you had heroes, people who would step up and put their lives on the line in the name of exploration and enterprise. We had robots going out beyond the solar system, telling us what was there. It was an incredible time and a scary time. And then, of course, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo flying in the amazing, amazing machine that they had in, in Star Wars. This is the kind of dream that was being fed into our mind at the same time as this fear and trepidation. And those kids sat there and they made choices. What am I going to do? How am I going to change the future? Coming along on the heels of this time was this promise that was laid in front of us of a thing called the space shuttle. It was going to fly 50 times a year. It was going to be $50 a pound to go into space. And we believed it and we got excited. We changed our lives to align with that. In the middle of that, a gentleman named Gerard K. O'Neill, who invented some of the core mathematics that created the super colliders, wrote a book called The High Frontier. The High Frontier basically said, you don't have to be an astronaut. You've got the right stuff. Use your tools, your imagination, and the tools of free enterprise, and create a new civilization in space. And we believed it, and we grew up believing it. At the same time, though, the aerospace industrial complex began to create its own machine, had its own destiny and its own mind, and that was about making money and keeping things going for the politicians. Some of us got a little upset about that, and the revolution began. I led this organization, the Space Frontier Foundation, for a while, and we took on that complex, and we began to fight it. And at the end of the day, we were able to get the space shuttle canceled. But that wasn't the end of things, even though some people thought it was. It was really just the beginning of the beginning. At the same time, technologists, engineers, entrepreneurs, business people who shared our dream were doing their part. The first private rocket ships were launched. I was lucky to be part of a team. We took over the Russian space station Mir for a few months. Other companies flew other types of machines and began to break the barriers to show that these things can be done and it's not just about the governments anymore. At the end of it all, some people said we had won the revolution, but I believe that isn't true. The revolution is still ongoing, and we still have a lot of battles to take on. In fact, we're still locked in the cage, but the lock is getting a little bit shaky. In fact, there are basically, I talk about three keys that we need to break out of that cage. The first key is transportation. You need to be able to get where you're going cheaply, reliably, and quickly. The second key is to be able to use the resources of the place you're going to do what it is you want to do. And the third key is to have a government that either supports you or at least stays, excuse my language, the hell out of the way. I threw an event in DC a while back called the Pioneering Space Summit. I was able to get a lot of politicians, astronauts, all kinds of people together, and we got them to agree on the text that's in yellow. I'll try not to do too much text but I, uh, I know this is a government conference, so I've got to throw in a little text just so that the people in the government will feel comfortable. So the idea that we came up with was that we believe the goal of human spaceflight in the United States was to enable the human settlement of the frontier. And that gradually began to permeate. Later on, I was part of an asteroid mining company, and we worked with the visionary government of Luxembourg. They put in legislation to support the idea. Then came the UAE, who declared that they were going to put a settlement on Mars in 100 years, which, by the way, makes them the first country on Earth to make such a declaration. Now, there are policies being put together around the planet, more and more every year. In fact, opening the frontier is actually becoming a thing. And we're seeing these different plans, these different regulatory structures, 
come online so that people could cooperate, so people could go out there and utilize the resources, so people could conduct business. And yes, business may be a dirty word to some people, but that's how we pay so that we can stay. And it's time for more and more nations to step up. In fact, why not Latvia? Oh, and there is this other country that's going too, for its own reasons. And you know what? I celebrate anybody that's going to go out there. Because I know that a few generations in, once they get out there, those kids of kids of kids of kids of the people that took them out there are basically going to say to their parents, to the nations that sent them there, you know what? Thank you, but we're independent and we're going to do our own thing. So really for me, it's about everybody going. So we still have the cage though. Because that first thing, that first element, which is how do you get there cheaply, quickly, and efficiently, is still blocking us. And that's because so many impediments, psychological and otherwise, have been put in our way. So along comes those kids. And this is something that's very, very important that you understand. You've heard about Elon, and you've heard about Richard Branson, and, and you've heard about Jeff Bezos. Some people think of them as billionaires in their toys, that it's you know, not good enough to have a, 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 you know, a fleet of cars or a yacht or an island or a private jet. You have to have your own space company now. That couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, some people have asked me about the business plan. What is Elon's business plan? What is Jeff Bezos' business plan? There isn't really a business plan as they're going into space. The business plan was to make money so they could do it. One of the people that got that book that I showed you, The High Frontier, earlier on, was a kid named Jeff Bezos. He gave the speech at his graduation ceremony and basically said, I'm going to make money and then I'm going to build cities in space. They're not going into space to make money. They made their money so they could go into space. And now it's happening. We're, seeing, we're beginning to see the advent of reusable rocket ships. Rocket ships, not rockets, rocket ships. Because you don't throw away the pieces of your ship. You don't throw away the pieces of your train. It's an exciting time. I've actually been down there to see where that launch I showed you earlier, that spaceship being developed, flew. It's pretty amazing. And Elon's going to Mars. Now along the way though, we need to be able to use the resources as I mentioned. Here's an earlier model, and by the way, I have to use models and language from my history. You can use your own. I'm not trying to offend anybody, and as I'll talk about later, we're not going to go to this new world and take it from anybody. This time we're going together. But I do have these models in my mind because I grew up in this culture in, in, in America. So for example, the middle part of America at the time was basically seen as a desert. You could say that this vehicle I'm showing you right now was the spaceship of its time. In fact, it's got six motors. We, well, we could call them horses in the front of it. Now imagine if this spaceship had had to carry the fuel for those six motors with it everywhere that they went in that new world. It wouldn't, wouldn't have happened. These are the engines right here, and that's the propellant, the grass. In fact, the vehicle itself is made of wood, also harvested from the new world. As we go into space, we're gonna be harvesting resources too, and unlike what some people say, we're gonna go out and mine tons of platinum and gold and bring them back to the earth, that may happen. The gold of space is water. And if you look into this, you'll find out that a lot of the attention on the moon is aimed at the poles of the moon where there might be frozen water in the craters that have never been hit by the sunlight. That's the land rush of the future, one of them. And that's why the United States and its partners are going to the south pole of the moon. But of course we have the asteroids. As I mentioned, I, I worked a little bit on an asteroid company at the time and we were going for the water. Why? Because if you have water, you can drink it, you can break it into hydrogen and oxygen, you can breathe it. And if you put those back together the right way, you've got rocket propellant. So as we move out, 
we're going to start going step by step out into the frontier. Now, I want to talk to you about something. You, you probably got it in a pocket or you're watching on it right now. This thing that's called an app development platform. It used to be a telephone. Now it's a global brain. You can get those pictures that were just mentioned of, uh, of kittens doing funny tricks. All of these things can happen on this little platform. Why is it so exciting? Well, because these technologies, the core technologies in this platform, were distributed to the people and given to the people so that they could be creative and do amazing things with it. This is our app development platform for the universe. Whereas the one that you've got in your pocket, your iPhone, or your Android, is accessible by millions of creative minds, and thus we get millions of creative ideas, our app development platform for the entire universe is a thing called the International Space Station. A friend of mine named Bill Gerstermeyer used to run the station, and I talked to him about this, and he said, look, you know, as we know, there are basically between three and six people at a time on the International Space Station. Three and six people. It takes 2.75 people just to keep the lights on. That means that the entire creative energy of the entire human race, looking out into the entire universe to come up with brilliant ideas, do experiments, to do black sky thinking, to do IP development, to do product development, boils down to 0.25 of a human being's time, or to max, 3.25 of a human being's time for the entire human race. This is also going to be changing. As you may have seen recently with SpaceX arriving at the station and the other commercial carriers stepping up, we're going to be starting to carry more and more people out there. There are also private space facility companies that are developing their own stations. They're literally going to bud off of the International Space Station. They send up a few modules. They send up a few private guests. You'll see a couple of them, I think three or four or six before the end of the year are going to be going up. And then they begin to develop their own facilities, and then they break off and move down what I call the orbital street. And a neighborhood, or a string of pearls, as a friend of mine called it, begin to form in the orbit of the Earth. And on these stations, people can start to do many, many different things. Now, think about what I said earlier about the transportation system, the spaceships, the railroads. Now we're starting to get the locations. And then, as we step beyond, we go to the moon. The moon, the moon that's been in our sky throughout the history of humanity, the moon that calls us forward. You know, it was once said that if, if God had intended humanity to go into space, she would have given us a moon, and she did. The moon, we're going. The first private missions have already started to fly. The first one wasn't so successful, but others are coming, and more and more activities will happen. And as I mentioned, we're going to start seeing the harvest of water on the lunar surface. Water and other materials. And then as we begin to branch out even further, we're going to go to Mars. Now, Mars is not a place you're necessarily going to be exporting anything from. It's a destination of the heart. It's a destination of the spirit. It's a place to go because you want to go. All of these places have resources. To me, I, when I talk to my friends about Mars, I joke with them that the best resource Mars has is it's got a sky that looks like the Earth's. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen probably in the next 10 to 15 years. Because once we can get that first 100 miles, as Robert Heinlein said, 100 miles up and you're halfway to anywhere. It all begins with the railroads and the ships, then we go to the moon, and then we're off to Mars. I say, and then here, we open free space, but actually it'll be happening in parallel. Free space is the place between worlds. It starts in low Earth orbit, and it goes from there and beyond. That's the area that gets me the most excited, because you can go out there and build rotating habitats. This is a sphere that's ro rotating. All the little green things that you see in there are gardening habitats, and it provides artificial gravity, just like the Earth's. All we need, as Dr. O'Neill said, is your imagination, your mind, the resources of space, free enterprise, democracy, 
and off we go. Enterprise works. You know, there are people all around the world, as there was said earlier, that could be watching this on their mobile phones right now. That's an enterprise solution. That's imaginations unleashed. And as people's imaginations are unleashed, they begin to do more and more things. They didn't get engaged more and more. It's a circle. It's a virtuous circle that carries you up and up and up. You know, there was this old myth, this thing that we fought against for so many years, that only the big boys can play in space, unless you're the Soviet Union or Russia or China or ESA. You're the only ones that can go. Everybody else gets stuck in the space ghetto. But now we're seeing individual human beings build their own space programs. If an individual human being can do it, why can't a small country? And now with the reduction of the size of electronics, people are able to fly, these are called CubeSats, 10, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and off we go. It's time to let these people go. It's time to let the imaginations of humanity loose on the solar system. These kids, these kids that actually go to one of my conferences in Austin, let's get them out there. Let's give them the opportunity. And let's share the wealth. We're starting to see the first public listings of companies. We're going to see more and more of that. We're going to see companies that are engaging in blockchain funding. We're going to see all kinds of openings so that you can actually get involved. It's an exciting time. And yes, we're on the verge of shattering that cage. Look, as I said at the beginning, it's really about her. It's really about the mother world. And it's really about her. Because while you're sitting at home, your kid is upstairs dreaming of the future. Or you, if you're a kid, are also looking at the future. And now, in a repeat of that cycle, the, board, the beginning of the space movement, we're facing more rough times. As you're scrolling through your feed rather than flipping channels now, you're seeing terrible things happen. It's all about greed, give me, give me, give me. We're seeing people wanting to hurt other people because they don't share the same beliefs. The inability of people to share in ideas, to, to find a, a source of equality, to find unity, these things are all missing or seem to be missing. I believe they're there. Not invented here. My land is my land. You can't come. These are the kinds of attitudes I believe will be shattered as we break out of this cage. And of course, pollution and the utilization of the earth, where our entire industrial civilization from its very beginning has been characterized by an attack on the living systems around us. Once again, the clock is a minute from midnight. And this time it's global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it. And I believe we have to take that on. I believe we have to take it on with full ferocity. And I believe it's going to be kids like these, kids like you, who are going to make it happen. William James, one of the great authors of the last century, the century before, said, that what we need is the moral equivalent of war. Now you have to think about that statement for a second, but it's the idea that war focuses your attention, draws out the maximum creativity and industrial possibility of a, of a, of a group of people, and it draws them together in unity. For the first time in human history, we can take on the moral equivalent of war as a planet, with one challenge and one opportunity, saving the planet and expanding our life into the universe. Look, we have all these reasons that people talk about when it comes to space. Why space? Well, it's science, it's planetary defense, it's the environment, it's politics, it's resources, it's tourism, it's energy. Those are all valid. Bottom lines on spreadsheets, etc., etc. How can I show that my country is cool? How can I be cool? All of these different things are good reasons, but I believe there are more important reasons. I believe we have a purpose. It is my stand that humanity is here for a purpose. And that purpose is based on three principles. To preserve and advance human civilization. 
We're not perfect yet. We've got a long ways to go. To protect and expand the domain of life. And to explore and experience everything in the universe. Wouldn't it be great to grow up in a universe, in a civilization where that was the mandate, where that was how you were judged? What a, what a world it would be, or worlds it would be, to live in that kind of a place. Everything I'm showing you here, everything I've shown you in this presentation so far, we can do. It's all based on current technology. We can do anything that I'm showing you. There's no magic. There is no beam me up Scotty here. We just haven't decided to, or most of us haven't, but some of us have. And as we go out in there, out there into the universe, think of the amazing things we can do to float above Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, the views, the places, the adventures. How exciting can that be? I believe humanity has a great future. You know what, I have an experiment for you. Tonight, if your skies are clear, I want you to go outside, I want you to lay on your back or go up on Tar, tar Beach, is what we used to call the roofs when I lived in New York City, or go wherever it is you are, find a clear sky, look up and look at the stars and allow yourself to fall up into that. Just feel it. Just feel it, feel the call. Feel the call of this place that we are in, this universe. You will feel it. If you let your mind clear, just go, just feel, just be with it. Because there is so much possibility out there. Some people decry that we are at the end of times, that it's all over, that all of those evil things I talked about earlier are gonna take us down. And yet I believe the creativity that we have within this civilization will take us up. Hope is a thing that we build. Hope is a thing that we create. We can have our feet stuck in the mud and still dream. It isn't either or. It isn't why can't we take care of these starving people over here instead of going here and expressing our dreams. No, it is the expression, the reaching for those dreams that lifts us out of these places. We can use the technologies of space to help save the planet. We can use the inspiration of space to help save us. It's time for us to go. I mean, think about it. There were more stars out in the universe than there are grains of sand on every beach and every desert on the planet Earth. And this is the end? No. This is the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. We are at the end of the most important hundred years in human history. It began with world wars, nuclear weapons, and in other words, apes with guns and bombs. And in the next 20 or 30 years, we're gonna know whether we're gonna be able to go further, rise above, and become what we have the possibility of becoming. I'm excited by it. I live for it. It's what gets me up in the morning. I want to give my daughter a future worth living into. I want to be able to say that I did something in my life that helped change the future. And you can too. Look, it is time for us all to go. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter the size of your country. It doesn't matter your national budget. Why not? Why not? It's up to you. You can make it happen. I believe we're here to go there. Thank you.